I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, Olivia Larson and Catherine Hollander. So Catherine Hollander is a senior research analyst with an outreach focus and Olivia Larson is a research analyst with an outreach focus for GiveWell. So GiveWell is an amazing organization. Uh, they're a nonprofit dedicated to finding and recommending outstanding giving opportunities in global health and development. So today we're going to be chatting to Catherine and Olivia a little bit about their career paths, how they got involved in effective altruism, and just some general advice for more junior people um, who might be looking at this as a career. And this is the second seminar in the Women in EA seminar series. So hi, Catherine and Olivia. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Great. Thanks for having uh, us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so I just get started uh, by asking you a little bit both about your background. Um, so what did you do before you your current role? Um, so working at GiveWell is actually the uh, only job that I've had in my uh, professional career. Um, so when I was in college, I got interested in effective altruism and learned about GiveWell, became a GiveWell donor and started following the blog and uh, ended up seeing that they were uh, hiring for summer research analysts. Uh, so in 2016, I joined the team as a uh, researcher. So kind of on the uh, core research team working on uh, our research into the most cost-effective giving opportunities. Um, that wasn't a great fit for me, even though I loved the organization, uh, kind of spending all day looking at randomized control trials and meta-analyses was uh, not my, like was not what my skills were best suited for. Um, so I uh, finished college, went to one year of business school, and then was able to join the team as a research analyst with an outreach focus. So I still stay up to date on the core uh, research that GiveWell does, um, but I spend most of my time talking to donors and other uh, interested people about uh, GiveWell's research, understanding their giving, and um, just helping them connect to uh, their gifts. Um, and so it was really uh, great to be able to find the uh, role at GiveWell that uh, was the best uh, fit for me. And uh, now I'm in a bit of a, a liminal space where I am halfway through business school um, and uh, took a few years off to work at GiveWell um, and hoping to uh, go back and finish business school uh, at some point in the nearest future. Great, and Catherine? Yeah, so I came to GiveWell uh, from a journalism career. So prior to working at GiveWell, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was covering uh, economic policy uh, for a few years, focused on the Federal Reserve and also healthcare policy. Um, so I always really liked the, the task audience. And uh, I moved to California in 2014 from Washington, D.C., just for personal reasons uh, and happened to get to know the staff of uh, GiveWell at that time through social connections. Um, and I had heard of, of GiveWell and effective altruism uh, through the economic policy journalism world a little bit, but I wasn't um, <laughs> very familiar uh, with, with GiveWell's work until I really got to know um, some of the GiveWell research staff. And so about halfway through my first year in California, um, which is where GiveWell is based, uh, I was told that there was a job opening at GiveWell for someone who was focused on outreach about our work. So really thinking about how we can share uh, the research that GiveWell does with a broad audience. And I was hired uh, in May of 2015, so five years ago, uh, as the first outreach-focused staff member at GiveWell. Since then, my role has evolved um, a lot. <laughs> when I was first hired, um, as the first staff member working on outreach, we knew that there would be a lot of outreach that we could do. We couldn't do it all, but I did a little bit of everything. So speaking to donors, uh, writing blog posts, uh, kind of pitching in on, on everything from um, biosecurity reports when open philanthropy was still part of GiveWell to um, working on conversation notes at times. So, so really doing a lot of different tasks at GiveWell. And as the team has grown, uh, and it has grown a lot in the five years since I have been there, uh, my role has become more specialized on really um, what we can think of as kind of research communications where um, I am writing blog posts and thinking about how we primarily share our work in writing since that's sort of my, my number one interest and skill set um, is writing about our work. Uh, so uh, that's really my dominant focus these days. 
Yeah. What are your motivations uh, towards like deciding what you wanted to do with your career and starting off in GiveWell? So Olivia, you mentioned that effective altruism was a key jump in point for you to GiveWell. Uh, yeah, care to elaborate a bit on, you know, some of the key things that drive you in your role and your interests? Yeah, so I definitely um, kind of just learned about effective altruism via a, a, a blog post that I clicked on on my Facebook feed. Um, so thank you, Facebook. Um, and it really, this idea that donations have opportunity costs and that we should try to maximize the benefits of our donations really resonated with me as a uh, freshman in college econ major who cared a lot about uh, doing good in the world. Um, and so this kind of broad sense of we should be thinking comparatively and critically and trying to do as much good as possible with our donations just uh, really uh, was a match for what I thought was really important. And so I ended up just spending, uh, and it was at a really good point in my career, uh, very early, <laughs> pre-career. Um, so I was really, uh, I think, uh, lucky to be able to then spend uh, a lot of time thinking about what uh, these new things that were, you know, in my uh, world and in my frame of vision now, would mean for a uh, for a career, and so when I was uh, looking for jobs at different points, uh, kind of along the way, I was you know following uh, eighty thousand hours and trying to do uh, some of the things that they said uh, might be helpful, um, and really trying to just think about where my particular skills might fit into uh, you know the effective altruism movement as a whole, and also kind of the uh, areas of effective uh, altruism that I'm most interested in, uh, namely kind of global health and development. And I think on a day-to-day -day basis, what really motivates me is just being able to see the generosity of the donors that I'm able to talk to, um, hearing about how people choose to spend their money to help other people is really great and something that kind of I aspire to be doing and I'm really happy that people are doing and it feels uh, good and kind of a self-reinforcing cycle in which I get to share about GiveWell to donors. They get to tell me why they like GiveWell. I'm uh, reaffirmed in uh, why I'm happy to be talking about GiveWell. Um, and I think that that's a, a pretty virtuous cycle that I am uh, feel really lucky to be having. Yeah, that's amazing. And Catherine? Yeah, so I uh, kind of thinking about my career, uh, I have always felt, I think, some pull to be part of, feel like I'm participating in a community with my career. You know, journalism was very much a, a part of a community function where you're sharing information to help inform people. And I think, you know, many journalists are motivated by an idea that they can help improve the direction of the world by sharing important information. And so uh, I think the, the GiveWell mission sort of really resonated with that, thinking about how to, you know, be a be a, a person who helps improve the world with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is really important to me. And I think that the first thing that really drew me to give well, you know, in addition to the mission of identifying very effective places to donate, just sort of resonating at a core level, um, was the transparency with which GiveWell was going about its mission. Um, before I started working at GiveWell, I decided that uh, in order to decide that I even wanted to work at GiveWell, that I would read back through every blog post that GiveWell had ever written um, to see like what the organization was about. And this is, this is a very big project. Um, the GiveWell blog has been going on for a long time. Uh, and there have been many things written uh, there over the years. But I really wanted to understand, you know, how, how the organization thought and also how it communicated about what it thought. And um, the idea that GiveWell was comfortable saying, we've looked into this, this is our best guess, but we don't know. We're not sort of feigning confidence. You know, we want to help empower you to make decisions by saying like, these are the evidence that, and data that we looked at to make this decision, but we recognize that the world is a complex place. Um, reasonable people could look at the same information, come away with a different conclusion, or, or maybe we've missed something, or maybe we've even made a mistake. And if we have, we would like you to tell us. That communication style, just resonated so much <laughs> with me. And I thought that was such an exciting project to be a part of. And on a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of motivation, um, I think seeing the work that our research team does and uh, how much thought and care they put into it, I feel a real 
excitement and obligation to, to share it well and to get it right and to hopefully connect with other people like me who, um, you know, maybe weren't actively in the global development space or, you know, actively aware of EA, but see this thing and um, realize that it, it really has um, some cool resonance. So I feel um, also just that it's, it's an exciting project to, to try to explain things uh, in a way that, that is motivating and clear. So those two things um, definitely keep me going every day. And so can you both tell me a little bit about what a like typical day looks like for you? It sounds like you have a really, or each of you have really varying roles. So I have been really focusing on uh, writing blog posts about our research. Uh, I mentioned the Givell blog has been around for a long time, but uh, we, I think, weren't able to prioritize uh, publishing as much as we wanted over the last few years, just due to constraints in staff capacity. Um, part of our interest in sharing uh, very transparently all the work we do is that we also tend to have a pretty high bar for what we want to publish and say about our work. Uh, and so uh, the project of sharing our work uh, is quite a big one. And so these days I've been really focused on that. And so what that might look like uh, in terms of working on uh, any particular post in a day could be having an initial conversation with the research team about a potential angle for a blog post, um, you know, outlining, writing, vetting, um, getting all the sources in order. Um, that whole process can take, uh, some blog posts take months from start to finish. Uh, we usually uh, vet them pretty closely and spend a lot of time on them. Um, so that, that could be maybe like half of my day. And then the other half might be um, working on various other uh, written communications, whether that's um, responding to donor questions or um, answering blog comments, um, talking to the media on behalf of GiveWell, um, and generally staying up to date on our research. So having one-on-ones with researchers and, and other staff at GiveWell as well, whose work um, we share uh, as part of our transparency practice. So that's a pretty typical day for me. Great, thank you. Yeah, and for me, I'd say on a typical day, I might have a, a donor call or two where I'm just uh, talking to uh, a GiveWell donor, either one that I've been, uh, you know, building a relationship with and trying to uh, just trying to kind of be a resource for them uh, continually within the organization or with a relatively new donor to say uh, thanks for their support. Um, so a lot of my uh, day is spent uh, kind of uh, either on those calls or thinking about uh, how to do that. So if uh, somebody might uh, come to me with a particular uh, question that they want to uh, discuss on a call, uh, like a giving opportunity in a particular area, um, I might uh, connect with uh, some people on the research team to uh, just be sure that I'm uh, up to date on our thoughts on that uh, particular area. Um, I also join the research team meetings to stay uh, up to date, up to date there, which are always uh, really interesting updates on what uh, kind of as our research team has grown, uh, different people have been uh, doing very different things. And so kind of coming together and hearing about, uh, I'm working on this, and this is my open question. I'm working on this other thing. And uh, here are my conclusions is always uh, really good. And then uh, the outreach team also uh, meets uh, on occasion and uh, just uh, chatting through and uh, providing feedback and hearing about what the uh, marketing team is doing with uh, paid organizing uh, kind of also constitutes uh, part of my role. So I'd say every day I spend some amount of time uh, staying up to date on what's going on at GiveWell, uh, some part of time uh, sharing that, um, and then uh, another part of the time you know, organizing things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've been looking at some of the EA forum posts recently, you know, and it just seems as though people who have the skills that you guys have, you know, and the ability to be able to be concise in reporting information and management and getting things done is, is huge. Um, okay, great. So both of you identified in your answers as why you were motivated uh, to pursue a career like yours, um, like a real fit with the culture um, of your organizations and your teams. So can you talk to me a little bit about what you really value in a workplace culture and in your teams? I think there are, there are a few different values that are true at GiveWell that I would really, if I ever went to work somewhere else, um, would love to, to see there as well. Um, you know, one is, is the commitment to 
um, trying to find the most true answer and, and being open to sort of many different ways of approaching a problem and many different truths being correct. Um, so sort of a, a general open mindedness and sort of shared goal of trying to reach the right answer. Um, it feels that there is absolutely a higher priority on trying to get the best information versus individuals proving that they are right or sort of digging in their heels to defend a position like there's really a you know, openness to, to the whole staff asking questions and interrogating our conclusions and really just trying to um, sort of push, push forward as much as we can. And, and I think related to that, and I think something that helps um, make that experience a successful one <laughs> is also just the culture of sort of respecting one another, um, treating each other with a lot of kindness and um, approaching difficult conversations with an open mind and, and sort of the idea that everyone on staff has a lot to contribute and that we can all connect as part of these conversations to, to improve the, the outcomes that, that we can all have. You know, everyone, everyone is very motivated by the outcome of um, finding and directing funding to the best giving opportunities that, that we can find. And so knowing that everyone plays a role in that and has something to share in that leads to um, really good discussions and, and pushing toward, toward trying to get the best answers we can. I think that um, another thing that's really important to me is, uh, I guess, I guess she did, she ta did talk a little bit about this, but um, having coworkers that are really, uh, you know, compelled by the same types of uh, things that I am really, uh, it's great to have people that uh, you trust to be thinking really well about uh, important questions and really motivated by the bottom line of helping the global poor. Another thing that I think I really uh, appreciate about GiveWell is uh, kind of flexibility at, and truth seeking at a bit of a meta level. So Catherine talked about uh, kind of in our research looking for things that are likely to be very true. Um, and I think that that's also true as GiveWell grows, as GiveWell starts uh, doing more and more interesting things in outreach and operations and expanding our research. Really having a flexibility to how we go about those things and uh, determining what sorts of things make sense to go at from first principles and what sorts of things make sense to kind of draw on what other uh, people, other organizations have worked on uh, in that space. And I might just add on, Olivia, Olivia Jarda thought for me on, on flex, another way that I, I really like the flexibility and um, this is a, a really different piece of workplace culture, but just, um, give wells flexibility in terms of how how you conduct your work like very much it's a place where you're not expected to be at your desk from nine to five um you know if you're a person who is a better morning person you're welcome to work your hours that way or if you need to work from home part of the day or if you want to break up your day so you work four hours then take four hours off then work four hours you know it's a very flexible work culture where the um you know main thing is whether you're getting your work done and really not like how how you're getting your work done in terms of you know where you are and, and which hours you work and, and i've also come to really appreciate that as well yeah i think that is like really interesting in how much that potentially impacts like staff satisfaction actually it's a question like mm -hmm. an answer that we get back a lot when we talk to people in different roles uh, with wham bam and with other positions but um yeah so what advice might you give somebody who would be looking to pursue a career like yours I would say that the uh, advice that I wish uh, I had gotten was uh, to really look for some for a job function that's a good fit. Um, kind of when I was just starting out, I thought, oh, I love GiveWell. I'll work at GiveWell um, in a research role, which kind of uh, anyone could have predicted uh, that actually kind of conducting the research probably wouldn't have been uh, the job function that I would have enjoyed the most. Um, and I mean, eventually I'm glad that I uh, kind of worked at GiveWell and spent that summer there. But I think that uh, initially I was really uh, undervaluing the extent to which it's, it was important for the particular job function to be something that matched with my skills and interests, as opposed to just thinking kind of at a broader scale. This is a nonprofit that I think is really great. And I think they're really impactful. I want to be impactful. I'll work there. Um, that does seem to be an important kind of thing to consider, but I think that uh, I was definitely really undervaluing and I think I'll be a great match for this particular function within that organization, if that makes sense. Very much, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. What Olivia said um, has is is very uh, true of my experience, and um, I think the the more I'm I'm honest with myself about like which types of tasks energize me, and then the more that I can drive my role toward those tasks, um, the happier the happier I am at work. So absolutely, um, I found that to be true. And uh, given my career has involved a lot of writing, <laughs> my best advice for people who are interested in writing oriented careers is to write as much as you possibly can. Um, this is advice that uh, I, I am certainly not the first person to give, but trying to write something every day, even if you think that it might not be published, um, even if you think it's not good, uh, is, is really important. Um, it's, writing is absolutely a muscle, and the more that you use it, the sort of more comfortable you'll be with it and the easier it will become. So um, if you're interested in a job that involves quite a lot of writing, I would say um, get to writing. It's, it's great. It's a great way to um, sharpen that skill and to practice. Fantastic. Have you ever come across any resources that you've particularly enjoyed with regards to like writing or do you just think it's like a case of application of skill and practice or? Yeah, I, um, I like reading a lot of writing. I think reading is a very good <laughs> tool mm. for writers um, and like trying to think about what I like when I read something or someone that I, someone whose prose I really like, like, why does this work? Why is this successful? Um, and trying to actually think a little bit about, you know, kind of step back and, and do the thought of like, okay, why is, why is this such a good, good piece or good book? Um, I've also, uh, I recently read at the recommendation of some Givewell staff, um, Deep Work, and that talks, uh, it's a, a book that is uh, by Cal Newport, and it talks about uh, like general productivity tips, and the uh, advice that it gives is really centered on like blocking out large chunks of time to work on projects uh, and finding ways to do that, and I think the for writing it's been particularly helpful because I think there's a temptation when you get stuck or when writing feels hard to switch over and try to work on something else and I really like that in this book um, the premise is like you choose an amount of time and this is the only thing that you can work on in that time and even if all you do is stare at a blank page it's okay um, because you're dedicating this time to this particular task um, and I've really liked that as well so just kind of getting all notifications out of the way dedicating blank time, just a writing time uh, has also been pretty helpful as well. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to a little bit about uh, the effective altruist community. Um, okay, so I normally ask people like what their origin stories are and when people ask me I don't have any good answers because it was, it was more of a like osmosis process for me where I just like was around it for long enough I was like oh yeah that's actually really cool but maybe you guys have a better story for this than I do but when you first became like aware of EA what did you find particularly interesting like what was a particular hook for you in getting further involved in checking it out more? So the article that I initially read that got me interested in uh, effective altruism was one about the ice bucket challenge. And so this was the summer that the ice bucket challenge was everywhere. I had been tagged in one, I had done one. And at that uh, kind of point in time, um, I was a college student, so I didn't have much to give, but I was uh, trying to give to charity every week. Um, so I was giving to a different charity every week, uh, you know, a very small amount. Um, and so the week that I got uh, tagged and did the ice bucket challenge, I gave uh, $10 to the uh, ALS Association. And then I read this article that was basically questioning whether donations that were made as a result of the ice bucket challenge were counterfactual. So whether they were uh, taking donations away from other charities. And I thought back to kind of the 24 hours before I had read the article and thought, wow, that was not a counterfactual donation. I was gonna make a donation that week either way. Um, and so I think the fact that that kind of point applied so literally to my own life really uh, made me think about, oh, where would I have otherwise given? How much more, how much better is where I did give than where I could have give, than I could have given and really, uh, it was like it was, yeah, just totally meant for me <laughs> and, the, and the way that I was approaching giving uh, at that moment in a non-principled uh, way. And so I think that the fact that it, you know, applied to my life was really uh, helpful in kind of making me stop and think a lot about it. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, just opportunity cost really, really got me as soon as I, uh, as soon as I kind of put some of the pieces together. Brilliant. And Catherine? Uh, 
Um, I, I don't have as crisp of a, a sort of moment <laughs> where I was, was introduced. Um, so my, my um, introduction to the concepts of effective altruism was, was certainly more um, gradual and came through, through GiveWell. Um, since, as I mentioned, uh, I, I sort of got to know GiveWell um, mostly through a social connection and then through GiveWell, of course, like became exposed to the ideas of, of effective altruism. Uh, and I think that there, there were many threads that sort of resonated with small things I had thought or done, but had never really stepped back and thought about. So um, I had been a vegetarian, but I wasn't you know, very familiar with work that was happening on the farm animal welfare front. Um, in college, my focus was on history of science and specifically the history of the nuclear age. So was very familiar with thinking about um, you know, the, the potential destruction that could be caused by nuclear weapons and sort of in that way, a little bit of the existential risk question had been on my mind for some years. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think that there was kind of a, a moment or a thing that was shared with me that, that really changed things, but rather sort of gathering all these ideas together, you know, the, the economics journalist part of me um, feeling resonance with this idea of cost effectiveness and maximizing impact. And, and again, like, yeah, farm animal welfare and vegetarianism and nuclear weapons and existential risk. So uh, it just kind of pulled together these various strands uh, of my, of my thinking and, um, you know, found that compelling. Great. And so just a quick follow up question on that, because um, this is something that I really toggle back and forward on so much. Like, why did you decide to focus on uh, global health and development uh, in comparison to like other uh, issue or cause areas? Yeah. What, so kind of why work at GiveWell versus maybe some of these other potential areas? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think global health had always just been an area of interest of mine in terms of, you know, news stories that I would read. Um, I think I, you know, at one point thought I would love to be a doctor, but was very squeamish around blood. So thought maybe that's not the right fit, but always thought that it was a great type of job. So, so I liked the idea of working in health and had covered the healthcare system um, here in the United States for a short period of my, my journalism career um, during the Obamacare rollout, um, which was really interesting. And um, through economic journalism, um, you know, I mostly focused on the U.S., but was thinking a lot about poverty reduction at that time. So, uh, you know, I, it, since I wasn't um, maybe familiar with effective altruism or, or 80,000 hours at the time, uh, I didn't sort of have this menu of potential things in front of me where I was very deliberately choosing. Um, but hearing about GiveWell, uh, the problems that GiveWell worked on certainly resonated with problems that I was interested in and excited in. So, um, yeah, it was less of a, a careful weighing of maybe like four potential paths I could take and, and more that this ended up being one that uh, presented itself and seemed very interesting. Great, thank you. So that again also leads itself really to the answer of like a comparative advantage in roles as well. I think in the past I've really underestimated how important that can be. Um, okay, so a, a quick question uh, with regards to like the future of effective altruism. And this is one of my favorite questions, I think, which is like, in 10 years, what is our end game or in 20 years or 50 years? Like, what do we want to see happen? And on the flip side, if we if this doesn't happen, uh, in speculation, like, why not? What are the key bottlenecks or key constraints to us reaching some of our goals? Yeah, maybe we can start on the global health side. I think I think about this a little bit more day to day than um, sort of for the broad, the broad EA movement, but starting yeah, with where, yeah, where the ball great. is, like, what would be really exciting for us in 10 years? Mm. Um, you know, I think, I think there are, uh, there's a version of GiveWell where we have identified, you know, many cost-effective opportunities and so expanded the number of people who use our research that we've like filled some of the major funding gaps that we see uh, globally. Uh, we do projects, um, I think each year, we, ha we have done at least recently, uh, to look at the total size of the global funding gaps for various um, various uh, programs that we work on. So looking at the total need for funding for malaria um, globally and looking at the total need for deworming funding globally and, and vitamin A supplementation, et cetera. And I think, um, you know, if we could do something like direct enough funding to close the malaria gap, that would be an extremely successful and exciting um, <laughs> thing that GiveWell could do uh, in, mm -hmm. in 10 years. Uh, you know, we still see a, a very, very large need there. Um, and then, you know, I think we would expect to, to just keep going down the list um, and just filling from most cost effective gap on down and um, looking for new things that, you know, maybe there are 
programs that don't exist today that could be really cost effective that we could support in the future. Um, maybe it will be really hard to find things that are very cost effective in the future and we'll have to um, shift our model. Uh, but I think right now we see, you know, significantly more funding needs than we expect to direct funding. And so, um, you know, for now, trying to continue to grow the number of people who rely on our research and direct funding to these, these important things is, um, is our, our top goal and, and something we would hope to make a lot of progress in over the coming decade. Yeah, um, another thing that I kind of I was thinking about would be uh, effective altruism or give well having an influence on uh, kind of aid flows. So um, thinking about how uh, rich countries like the US and the UK um, give uh, money to uh, in foreign aid um, and thinking about whether kind of effective altruists or uh, kind of or give well uh, could help make that more effective or be a resource for uh, directing some of that toward things like give wells priority programs. And so that's something that uh, we've been uh, working on and trying to uh, do some work in for the past uh, few months, maybe half a year. Um, and uh, it's something that could be really impactful uh, if successful at bringing uh, some of these ideas into these uh, huge foreign aid flows, although uh, definitely could be something that uh, could not occur if uh, relationships aren't, uh, you know, built in the ways that uh, they should be or whether or if kind of the uh, constraints that uh, these uh, these funders face are uh, different and require different uh, different uh, things to be weighed other than uh, kind of cost effectiveness. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, so before we move on to the audience questions uh, in a couple of minutes, um, so we've had a lot of discussion recently on the EA forum um, about skills and insights that might be underrepresented in talent pools uh, within EA. And so I just wanted to ask you guys um, whether or not you see any like skill or insight gaps in your own work. If you know you had a hire walk in tomorrow, you know, like what skills would your ideal hire have potentially? Yeah, there, there are a couple of positions that we're actively trying to hire for right now. Um, so would love to highlight those here, especially if there's anyone in the audience who, who might be a good fit. Um, you know, we're, we're working to hire researchers at all levels of seniority, but in particular, senior fellows um, who are among our, our most senior researchers um, who typically have an advanced degree with a quantitative focus. Uh, we're also looking to hire content editors uh, who are um, staff members at GiveWell who really help us publish the kind of high quality information that we, we strive to share. Um, most content that's published on the GiveWell website has gone through a content editor um, for proofreading and vetting and um, making sure you know, we, we back up every claim that we make. Um, so it's this hugely important part of our work. Um, and often you know, we, we have more information that we want to publish than we're able to publish um, because we don't have enough content editors. So we're hoping to hire additional content editors to help us you know, be able to share more information uh, with a general audience. And, and that job um, is really suited toward people who have a lot of detail orientation and writing and editing skills. And the hiring is primarily based on a work test. So there's not a specific background that, that you're required to have. Um, but if those are skills that you have, uh, we would definitely encourage you to apply. Generally, GiveWell's uh, research team is uh, pretty capacity constrained. So we're really excited about the uh, kind of idea of uh, hiring people who are really great fits, um, which generally uh, consists of really uh, good critical thinking skills, uh, good understanding of kind of causality and being able to uh, understand uh, how uh, a randomized control trial, for example, or a piece of more nebulous research um, translates into kind of real world impact, um, as well as kind of strong communication skills. Um, and a uh, desire uh, for using those to help the global poor. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm just looking at our sheet of questions for you guys and we have some great ones. Uh, so I'll just start to work down them a little bit. So a first question is, what would you like to see more students in effective altruists doing uh, that could contribute or translate into impact? And do you have any specific suggestions of good sources or groups to team up with? One of the things that kind of uh, comes to mind is most uh, resonant uh, to me is uh, to do uh, some kind of spreading the word about uh, effective altruism and give well. 
uh, a lot of the donors that I talk to learn about, uh, kind of you mentioned students, um, a lot of the people that I talk to learn about effective altruism and give well in college uh, like I did. And so things like uh, starting student groups or just uh, kind of sharing information about the types of, uh, about how to think about giving, about how uh, lucky many of us are and about how um, we can leverage those resources uh, to do good at a time when a lot of people are uh, thinking about what to do and thinking about how uh, they can do good and uh, formulate their life um, seems really impactful. And I know that the uh, student groups uh, uh, resource at Center for Effective Altruism uh, is a good one, as well as uh, Give Well Grantee One for the World, um, which uh, helps create which helps create and support student groups, uh, one, one for the world groups, um, to uh, encourage people to uh, commit to giving uh, a portion of their income to, uh, to uh, highly effective charities. Yeah, Olivia, you said it. I don't have much more to add mm -hmm. on that other than um, maybe to uh, start the process kind of as early as you can of, of thinking through which um, tasks you enjoy, like which which are the skills that you're most excited to practice, um, you know, in your in your day to day life? Um, as a college or university student, uh, you know, we both talked a lot about like, finding the specific job functions that felt like a good fit for us. Um, so if you're able to kind of start start listening to those gut feelings about like, oh, I'm doing this thing and I'm I'm really happy, I love doing it, um, and thinking about what types of jobs might align with that, um, I, I think you can't start that process early enough. <laughs> Um, so one of the questions we have is, do you see GiveWell's attitude towards uncertainty and evolving over time? So Catherine, this might be a really great one for you because uh, you've been with GiveWell for quite a long time now. Yeah, so uh, GiveWell has always been very comfortable with uncertainty and, and sharing that uncertainty and expressing it internally. So at the sort of very high level, um, you know, I think, I think we're always happy to acknowledge uncertainty. We know that the types of things that we research are, are really tricky um, and that it's hard to understand exactly what the right answer is to get perfect information. Um, so uncertainty is something we've, we've been comfortable with for a long time. But I think in terms of how that is playing into our research, there has been a bit of a shift in terms of what types of evidence we're, we're able to consider as part of our research process. So. Uh, going way back, uh, even many years before my, my time at GiveWell began, uh, when GiveWell was started in 2007, our co-founders were coming out of the finance industry and they um, didn't have any specific information or um, experience in charity evaluation. So, you know, they, they were generalists, uh, were comfortable with numbers, comfortable with, you know, doing cost effectiveness analyses, but not, um, you know, charity evaluation experts or um, philanthropy experts or, or global health experts. And so the types of uh, information that they looked at to assess charities really um, focused on randomized control trials, uh, which they felt, you know, were, were fairly straightforward, um, you know, studies that they were able to assess. And as GiveWell has grown and uh, brought on a lot of expertise to our staff, um, including, you know, PhD economists of whom we're trying to hire more, uh, we have developed a lot of in-house expertise in, in assessing different types of evidence. And so, you know, we're, we're open to looking at um, interventions that we might not have previously been able to consider because they didn't have randomized controlled trials. Now, you know, we uh, feel more confident in our ability to look at evidence bases that uh, go beyond that. And so, you know, one area in particular that we're looking at um, is public health regulation, which um, would mean, you know, working with groups that work with uh, low and middle income country governments to enact or pass policies um, that could benefit the health of, of many people. Uh, we wouldn't expect to see uh, randomized control trials uh, demonstrating the impact of this type of work, you know, in all contexts that we could draw from. The type of information that we would need to understand the effectiveness of an organization that works on public health regulation would be more along the lines of, you know, case studies of places where public health regulations have been put in place and um, sort of conversations with people who've worked with particular groups that, that try to achieve these outcomes to see how effective we think those groups are. And so, you know, as we have matured as an organization, we are starting to look into to evidence types that, that do feel, you know, somewhat different from, from the, the randomized control trials that were so closely affiliated with GiveWell when we first began. Thank you so much. That's a really insightful question. Uh, yeah, I definitely have um, 
look back at some of the old Give Well blogs and just notice so many changes. And yeah, always been really, really impressed with that as a resource uh, for people wanting to learn more about Give Well. I definitely think the blogs are a really good place to start potentially. Um, okay, so question uh, here about communication with donors. So how important is it for GiveWell to communicate to donors with your research, research versus share research to help other researchers in the space? For example, those working on impact evaluation or program selection within NGOs. Yeah, I think that that's a really uh, interesting and a hard question, particularly mm -hmm. kind of GiveWell's committed to transparency. But then the question is kind of what does transparency mean? Who is the audience that we're, uh, that we're talking to? And kind of having one website that tries to both be a resource for, uh, I mean, give well researchers when they're looking for information on a project will often just Google, like give well the project they're working on. Um, so kind of having this website as an internal resource for GiveWell, an external resource for, uh, for policymakers or people that are uh, thinking, about, thinking about this all day, every day, and a retail donor who's looking to spend uh, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, even three hours uh, trying to understand a giving opportunity. Um, the right resource for all of those things is certainly kind of not the same. Um, and so to be honest, I'm not sure if I have a good answer as opposed to, I guess, more elaboration on why that's a really good question. <laughs> um, because this is something that uh, we've been thinking about a lot internally at GiveWell. I think that um, the research team, as they uh, try to kind of communicate clearly about their research, um, want to be able to have it such a, like communicate clearly enough such that uh, somebody who's really uh, committed to understanding why GiveWell recommends something so that they could disagree um, is what they're looking for. And so then it's uh, a little bit more of the role of the outreach team to think about how we can package that, how we can uh, add additional layers or take uh, parts of that information to share with uh, donors who might have less time, who might not want to kind of understand the, uh, the very most details of our, of our research, while at the same time kind of knowing it's there if they were interested. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's something that at the Life You Can Save, we really go back and forward on so much is just like these different classes of communication for different donors with different intents and motivations. Great. Okay. So just following up a little bit on the previous question with regards to randomized control trials. So uh, we have a question here about it's a really long path to getting randomized control trials ready. So do you think that there should be more funding and focus in the community on developing a better pipeline of promising interventions or on the final hurdle of robust RCTs? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, and, and thinking about you know, where, where the focus would be, um, you know, it's, it's an important, important thing to consider. Uh, you know, I think we, we often, and, and maybe this is helpful context just for like how, how we use RCTs mm -hmm. still. And, and I did mention, you know, we are expanding the types of research we use. We still consider um, randomized control trials to be among the best. So if there is something uh, that we can look at that has an RCT, like that is still very exciting to us. Um, you know, they're, they're an exceptionally good type of evidence. Uh, and so, you know, we, we often start with looking at um, new evidence that's generated, whether that's randomized control trials or other types of trials uh, for the effectiveness of programs, uh, independent of charities that are implementing those programs. So kind of the first step in our process is just saying like, which, which are the types of things that a charity could do that have the best evidence behind them? Um, once we've identified those, then we go looking for a charity that is implementing that, that type of program. And so, you know, the, the um, pipeline of research to inform programs that we should look into is kind of the, the first part of our process. Um, and the, uh, you know, asking a charity to demonstrate that it's implementing that program successfully is an is a important but second piece of our process. Um, but we need both in order to make a recommendation. So I'm not sure uh, I can say you know, where overall funding should be allocated. Uh, we do know that it is very expensive for organizations to collect excellent monitoring and evaluation 
uh, information. Uh, we have funded third party uh, groups like a group called ID Insight, which we've worked with on a number of projects over the years to um, do that work uh, when we have questions about that from charities who might not have the budget or capacity to implement that themselves. Um, we also think that's a really good argument for giving charities unrestricted funding or supporting their operations in a broad way. So, you know, that's something where maybe you as an individual donor could even have an impact in enabling the charity to do more of this, this type of work, which is also very important to our process, um, which is helping them fund uh, monitoring and evaluation through, through your support. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you guys two, uh, two last questions um, before we wrap today. And again, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, okay, so I think one of the uh, top rated questions here is how is COVID-19 uh, impacting your roles and impacting GiveWell's work? Olivia, do you want to start or I'm happy to... Yeah, I'm uh, happy to uh, happy to start. I can start with maybe my role, and then you can talk a little bit about the research since I know you wrote that blog post. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that uh, we're all working from home. Obviously, you can see my uh, plant and Christmas lights in the background. Um, but so yeah, uh, coronavirus is definitely uh, impacting Give Walmart, but kind of more <laughs> more importantly, um, the types of there's a lot of donor interest in uh coronavirus and uh, a lot of questions about both uh whether there are ways for uh donors uh, who are interested in kind of impact focused giving to uh support uh charities that are working to address coronavirus and important questions about how they how um you know this pandemic will impact our uh recommended charities as they um as you know, they're working on these uh, preventative health measures often, um, and these things that used to be costless, like knocking on someone's door and giving them a pill, um, now have this uh, risk of transmitting this uh, fatal disease, um, or you know, even just the act of uh, administrating administering de deworming pills, which happens uh, at school usually. Um, and so, yeah, these are kind of big questions for. Uh, the research team to be uh, thinking about and making our recommendations based on and uh, for the outreach team to be kind of trying to uh, listen to donors and understand how uh, it's uh, impacting their giving. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and just expanding on that too a little bit, like the, um, the sort of overarching question that guides all of GiveWell's work is how can I have as much impact as possible with my donation? And so the question that we're asking now is, you know, how can I have the most impact as possible with my donation and does the pandemic change that? And so that's led to these sort of two, two different um, streams of work, uh, both of which Olivia mentioned. Uh, one is really understanding the impact on our existing top charities, um, whom, you know, we, we expect they will all be impacted um, due to the way that they conduct their programs uh, and also the global funding landscape shifting. Uh, the second is, you know, are there things that we should be supporting now um, that, you know, are directly or indirectly responding to the effects of the pandemic? And so we've dedicated uh, research capacity to that question. So saying, like, are there grants that we should make today that could help prevent the spread of the disease? Uh, and for the first uh, batch of grants that we've made, uh, we prioritized moving relatively quickly. Um, if you're not super familiar with GiveWell, our, our process for evaluating charities typically takes a very long time. Um, you know, a year could be more than a year to really evaluate a charity to get it to the point of, of naming it one of our short list of top charity members. Um, but for these grants, you know, acting sooner than later seemed really important. So what we were able to do was to um, do a much shallower investigation than we would typically and to sort of move funding out the door uh, relatively quickly. So we've made three grants so far. Uh, we published information about them on our website. Uh, we, because we were moving quickly, prioritized um, fo focusing on organizations that we were already familiar with. Um, and the grants that we made uh, went to Development Media International, which is one of our uh, standout charities for work that they're doing on public health messaging around COVID-19. Uh, ID Insight, a group that I mentioned earlier that we've worked with uh, to support work that they're doing to inform policymakers in low and middle income countries on COVID-19 response. Uh, and also a Yale economics professor, Mushfik Mubarak, for his work uh, with the Bangladesh government. And uh, we've written more about the rationale on our blog if you're interested in, in reading more. And we're continuing to see if there are other things that we think that we should support. Uh, 
uh, in response to, to the pandemic as well as following the impact on our current top charities. So uh, Catherine and Olivia, um, one of the key questions here is what kind of work could we do on our own to prepare for a researcher role or an other role at a place like GiveWell? Yeah, I think on the research team, um, it just really what we're looking for is people that have a, uh, you know, strong understanding of uh, how to evaluate evidence and how to come to, you know, really justified conclusions and uh, conclusions that are likely to be right based on that. So I think anything uh, that you can do to try to uh, practice that skill and work on that uh, could be helpful whether that's taking a statistics class or a development economics class, or whether it's just kind of reading uh, GiveWell's intervention reports and trying to uh, see how we kind of try to tease out uh, the open questions. Um, I also think that one kind of uh, larger skill to uh, either practice or keep in mind would be uh, something that Catherine mentioned earlier in terms of kind of really truth seeking more important than kind of making an argument. So uh, in communication, instead of where we kind of are doing research and making uh, judgment calls and making assumptions, instead of trying to sweep those under the rug or make it seem like you definitely made the right judgment call or assumption, really bringing those questions uh, to the surface and highlighting them and saying, this is the judgment call that I made. Um, I think it's a reasonable judgment call, but here is where uh, you might disagree. Um, and kind of that's, I think, really key to being a successful researcher at GiveWell. Um, because we just want to be uh, communicating uh, as well as we can and getting uh, people's uh, and getting that information that way. Thank you. Yeah, definitely agree with what Olivia said. Um, I'll second my uh, call to write. If you think that writing or, or communicating and writing is something that you want to do and just kind of getting that practice, that's something that you can do um, on your own uh, and is really valuable. And um, I might also plug the content editor position if you are someone who likes writing and editing uh, and, and that that's a skill that you want to, to, to use in your job, uh, there are opportunities to do that now at GiveWell. Okay, thank you both so much. It was such a pleasure to speak to you today and I really appreciate the time that you took uh, to come and talk to us.